Hello, it's Scott Madley here with another episode in my tutorial series. We have our encounter laid in with our target. We're 0.2 kilometers away, or rather, we will pass within 0.2 kilometers. So, of course, I use the built in warp 2 mechanism to put me as well, relatively close to, to the object in question. Once we're within a few kilometers, of course, both objects become loaded and we start to perform our terminal rendezvous. Now, look at the nav ball. You want to make sure it is switched into target mode. It shows that we're only moving at 4.5 meters per second relative to this. Now, of course, Anyone that knows Division will know that we're about 140 seconds out, about 1 minute 40 seconds, so we're, we're going to have to operate roughly on that time scale. The important thing is, you see that my velocity vector is offset from the, the purple position vector here, right? So that is me showing that I'm moving towards that. So if I thrust slightly off here, you see how the thrust is pushing that vector away? That's just what happens with a retrograde vector. If you thrust like offset from it, it will tend to push it away, whereas if you're firing towards the prograde vector, then it will tend to push the vector towards the direction you're thrusting. It's a kind of a common trick. So what I'm just doing is trying to keep that thing lined up with the purple vector. Moving in at about 3 meters per second, uh, using time acceleration here just to make sure that it happens quickly enough for the impatient members of the audience. And as you see, the small changes get larger and larger, so I make another adjustment. Looks like I'm going to be coming through around the correct side. I did not plan that, that is entirely down to luck here. What I'm going to do is, once I get very, very close, I'm going to align the spacecraft, get my velocity down to zero, essentially, as, as close to zero as is possible. And then we will switch to the onboard reaction control system, rather than the main engine. So just letting this move in. You can see the docking port there. Well, that's uh, where we're going to dock the two spacecraft together. So yeah, let's just finally go for zero meters per second here. Point one. Being extremely careful here. And I think at this point, we're just going to go with it. So I'm going to right click on that port and say set as target. Similarly, you want to right click on the port on your spacecraft and control from here. That means that the nav ball is synced up with it. Now, for visual orientation, you actually want to adjust the camera here so that you're going to get everything lined up. Put the camera behind it and press V until you find locked mode. It used to be called chase mode and I keep making this mistake that I select chase mode and then turning. No, it's locked mode. And locked mode means that once you start turning your spacecraft, the camera will turn with it. So I'm going to rotate my spacecraft and now try to make sure that the docking ports are roughly pointed opposite to each other. It doesn't need to be too precise, you can fix that up later. Now finally, we're going to take control by pressing R. And now we have a completely new set of controls to use, right? We have the translation controls here. Now uh, you have I and K control up and down, J and L control left and right, and H and N control back and forth. This is going to be something that you will experiment with. Once again, I strongly suggest pressing F5 and saving before you attempt this in case you end up running out of RCS fuel. So you can see that I'm not quite as lined up as I would like, so I'm just going to rotate this a little more. And from this angle, you can see that the spacecraft is drifting downwards, so I want to thrust uh, I want to thrust downwards as well to counteract. That's pressing the I key to do that. Now it's moving upwards. Actually, it's pretty lined up here. It is drifting off to the left. Now you can also thrust it back and forth relative to the target using H to go forwards and N to go backwards. You don't want to find yourself going in towards the target until you've got it lined up. So I'm pressing J to kind of slide sideways, but once I get lined up there, I'm going to press L to counteract, and you, you can see the little thrust jets coming out there, right? Now at this point, I have, because I've got the spacecraft aligned in terms of rotation, I'm now using the nav ball below, so I am just want to make sure that the spacecraft remains aligned with that pink position marker, and now thrust forwards using the H key to just give myself a little bit of speed. You can see the speed is about 0.2 meters per second. That's actually pretty fast for a docking in space. So, 
All I'm doing is I'm watching as the thing drifts left and right on the nav ball below, and I'm making sure that I make these adjustments. At this point, I don't need the camera behind me. The, I can move the camera wherever I like to get the most dramatic look of the do at the docking. As I get in closer, it's clear that the position starts to deviate a little more because the small imprecisions get amplified. Also note the distance is based upon the center of the other spacecraft, when in fact we're close enough for magnetism to pull us together, but we won't dock until we're perfectly aligned. So disable your RCS and then disable your SAS. Your SAS is trying to stop your rotation. As soon as you stop that, it will rotate into position due to the magnetic field and you have docked successfully. And at this point, you probably have tried this a dozen times. You should seriously congratulate yourself. Look, I have a contract complete. Congratulations. It's like a handshake in space, only with less hands and less shaking, or something like that. Okay, we have our spacecraft. We're going to take this spacecraft to the moon. Quick save again. Okay, so by this point, everyone is no doubt an expert in transferring to moon. You've probably all done it a million times before. There's a few little things you have to be careful of here, and we will get to them. But first of all, we have to set up our maneuver node. So once again, you go out, find, set the moon as your target. I like to put it on the right and then select the bottom of the orbit here. Just, the idea is you're going to be 90 degrees away from the orbit, which actually corresponds to the moment when the moon rises. So bring this up to the orbit, you can get as close as you like. If you get it exactly on, then you will be traveling with the, the lowest relative velocity. And then drag it, drag the node around the orbit until you get an encounter. See that? Brilliant! They are 26 kilometers. See how easy that is? No, that is only part of what we have to do here. We're, we've got ourselves set up. We don't know how long the burn is going to take because we haven't set up our engines. Importantly, you've just docked and you have two, sp two engines on opposite sides, so you need to disable the one on the lander, right? Otherwise, you will have two engines firing against each other. You'll generally find that once you get into space, activating stuff through the staging system isn't that useful. Uh, staging tends to be much more useful when you're doing rapid things like taking off and landing, right? Uh, that's when you're going to use your staging mainly. The rest of the time will be for action groups and for, uh, you know, right-clicking on everything. <laughs> okay, so we're getting about two minutes out. I suspect that this burn will take a couple of minutes, so I'm just going to stop close to this. Before we fire our engines, we should right-click on the command pod and select control from here. It's embarrassing to fire with two engines, even more embarrassing to fire your engines in the wrong direction. While we're waiting, we should probably actually deploy these solar panels that we have. See them here? Right-click on them and extend panels. You can assign these to action groups if you've unlocked the relevant technology. But, you know, that's always required. that always requires preparing in advance. I'm terrible at that kind of thing. I do all my calculations for Delta V, but I never remember to set up action groups. So a word of warning, if your spacecraft has a very big engine and you've got a lot of mass on that docking port, if that other spacecraft is very heavy, you can sometimes find your whole spacecraft starts to flex around the docking port. In that case, you probably want to throttle back. Similarly, if you use time acceleration with this particular design, it's entirely possible that you find the spacecraft starts to bend in the middle. Again, if it starts to bend, you've got to throttle back. Either cut down your time acceleration or throttle down your engine. But this is looking pretty stable. Uh, so we're just going to let this go all the way out to the moon. Now, I'm just going to let the navigation marker, the maneuver node, just kind of slide off there. I'm really more concentrating on the prograde vector, and I will make sure that my encounter is correct after it all. If you find that your spacecraft is wanting to rotate away from that prograde vector, that fixed vector, it's a sign that your spacecraft is bending, and what happens when it bends is the center of mass shifts off to the left or right, and then the thrust you're applying will cause the whole thing to rotate. So. Just be aware of that. Don't worry too much about the maneuver node. Just holding position is probably the most stable, uh, the most stable orientation. The thing that's least likely to cause your spacecraft to snap in half. So slow the thrust until we get the encounter, and then kill your thrust 
Okay, so that's 62 kilometers. Let's just remove the maneuver node there. I'm going to bring it down a little closer now. There we go. 29 kilometers. Excellent. Notice how that bump, that wobbled a little after I turned off the engines. That is just the inherent wobbliness that comes from having an object attached to these docking ports. That's pretty good. Okay, we are moonward bound. Gonna quick save here. Now for this particular mission, I want to be in a high inclination orbit around the moon so that I pass over all the biomes. I'm gonna focus view on the moon and you can see the orbit that I actually have. Not very high inclination, so I want to adjust my encounter. Best way to do this is to pick a point roughly halfway along your orbit, uh, essentially at 90 degrees you know, in terms of orbital plane there. I think that's a, that's a good place. If you do it too early or too late, it takes more delta V, more, more fuel. Now I'm going to uh, pick one of the normal nodes and just rotate. And you see how it brings the node over the top, but it disappears. So I need to adjust that back inwards. Uh, I think for, yeah, prograde is doing it in this case. You might find that retrograde is what you need. But yeah, see that? Just make sure it doesn't hit the moon. That is pretty good. Just try to fine tune this to get as perfect a polar orbit as possible. There, little, little tiny, tiny adjustments here. At 30 kilometers, uh, yeah. Just a little more. And then slow that down. I want to get it exactly over the pole because it looks cool. <laughs> And of course, this is what you're going to have to think about if you're trying to rendezvous with another spacecraft in one of these orbits, is you're going to need to launch at a very similar time. That's the only downside to a polar orbit. So we're going to warp to the maneuver node. And that's going to be a 21 meter per second burn, a very small, I mean, that's practically a thimble full of fuel. Okay, I exaggerate, but, uh, you know, that's, uh, what, 70 feet per second, roughly, difference? For comparison, the space shuttle in orbit, the orbital maneuvering system, had only about a thousand feet per second of delta V available to it. On the space shuttle, that's enough to adjust the perigee and apogee rendezvous and return, but it wasn't enough to do, for example, a significant inclination change maneuver. And, and that's why, by the way, when Columbia was in space, a lot of people were saying, why didn't, you know, they could have rendezvoused with the space station if they'd known. No, they couldn't have rendezvoused with the space station because they didn't have the delta V to make the plane change. Anyway, just for reference, if you were to try to perform uh, an inclination change at the moon, in low moon orbit, it would take about 800 meters per second to do, uh, to do a change from a, an equatorial to a polar orbit. Anyway, now we have our desired encounter trajectory, we need to turn that encounter into an orbit. So you select the point nearest to the moon, the, the peri-moon, I guess is what you would call it, and then just drag out the retrograde vector until you get an orbit which satisfies your particular level of OCD in terms of orbital circular circularness. Uh, going to try warping to that particular time because warping to a maneuver frequently doesn't actually work when you switch spheres of influence and are on hyperbolic trajectories. Now, while we're up at about 700 kilometers, it's actually finally time that we can do some science with these astronauts. We brought the whole science team here and let's actually start this. So, what have we got? We have... A pressure sensor. Does this work? Yes! Aha! Now, the instrument reads zero as if it were in a vacuum. There's some new information here. I can keep this data and transmit this data, but you see how it has data analysis plus 12 science? That is a reference to the science lab which is attached here. Now, the science lab isn't active because there's no actual crew in the lab. To move the crew, I need to left click on the crew hatch for Bob Kerman, transfer, and then click on the lab. So now he has moved from the command pod into the lab and we can start researching the science data that we have collected. I'll transfer Ali Kerman down there as well. So there, there's going to be two crew in the lab. Uh, that's the maximum number that the lab allows. Scientists are what you want in the lab, just in case you were wondering. Or wondering. Now where's that uh, pressure sensor? Select it again and review the data. Now you see I have process and lab module and that puts it, it puts data into the lab. It doesn't put science in, it puts data, and the data can be converted to science over time. 
Now, the amount of time it takes to convert that data into science depends on how good your scientists are. And in fact, apparently you can have as many scientists you want on the ship as long as you have a couple of people in the lab. I have 30 data and my rate of conversion is, frankly, lousy. Uh, <laughs> But one important thing to realize is the amount of data you ultimately get out, or the amount of science you get out, I think is, is fixed. It's five points of science for every point of data you get. So we're going to collect the mystery goo. Even although we have already collected mystery goo data, we can collect uh, data for the processing lab. What we, have, we can do this with all the instruments, I believe. It's important to note with, that with the mystery goo and the materials exposure bay that you never get 100% of the science with a single uh, data point. So you need to keep doing that to kind of knock it down. So yeah, materials bay gives us a ton of uh, scientific information for our boys down in the lab. Uh, well, down, I mean it's space. Down and up is kind of a our philosophical concept at this point. Now, the temperature, you see that we have no recovery in the science, but we still get lab data here, right? So we're collecting the science data lo or the temperature data locally, and we can still get 20 points to convert. So just because you have already run an experiment in that particular region doesn't mean that you, you can't actually get data. And, and I've just realized that I can't do the crew report because both of my crew members are sitting in the science lab doing their fun sciencey things. I'm sure they're having lots of fun there, sciencing away to their heart's content. And if I right click on the lab, well I can see I can get almost over a quarter science per day now. That's pretty good, but I can't actually do a, a crew report from inside the science lab. Apparently they need a better window than that. Maybe the science lab has no real windows because they don't want the scientists getting distracted by the beautiful view of the moon growing larger in their windows as they fall towards the mineral surface. Actually, you know, I, I probably should actually do this, collect this data while I'm in high orbit because I'm not coming back to high orbit for a while. Transfer in there, do the crew report, process in the lab module, and then uh, once we've got that, I mean, I'll have to do an, an EVA to actually collect all the science data later, but I'll do that when the time is right. I'm gonna, he can EVA out as well and collect, uh, collect EVA data in high orbit. Look at that! More stuff. Now, in this case, he doesn't have the automatic option to process it in the lab. So, what he's going to do... Wait, wait a second. We're going to board the spacecraft, and then we're going to review the stored data, and then we can process it in the lab module. And now he's fulfilled his, uh, well, scientific duties in the cockpit, we can send him back into the lab to start collecting the all-important science data. So there, uh, I'm gonna transmit that anyway. And now it's time for us to continue our approach to the moon. I'm gonna let the probes handle it because he's not needed in the cockpit. The probes are, are technically better pilots than either Bob or Ali Kerman, on account of the fact that they do have access to the stability control option. Okay. Getting a great view of the pole from high up. The camera, as you pass over the pole, I'm trying to fix it, the camera it will actually rotate automatically because the coordinate system is based upon like a cylindrical mapping. And that means that as you get to the poles of the planet, the cylinder becomes a very poor approximation. That is also the reason why the pole on the moon is very, very hilly. The, the, the mountains are very tightly grouped and finding a place to land at the poles can be a major challenge. Just as a warning, if you're landing at the poles, you're going to have to be very careful about selecting your land, landing site. You're going to have to go all Neil Armstrong and pick a good clear spot. Anyway, I think we're at po the point to fire our engines throttle up just to 50% for now. We're going to bring this around. Uh, again, you want to be very careful that you don't overdo this. If you overdo this, you will find yourself uh, on a, an orbit which intersects the planet. I mean, here's the thing. Technically, all paths around a planet are orbits, but the ones hitting the surface are intersecting orbits, and we tend to call those falling instead. When you jump up, you know, a little, for a fraction of a second above the planet Earth. Technically, you are, in fact, orbiting the planet, but you're just in a, a very tight, eccentric orbit with <laughs> close to uh, apogee. 
for a very limited amount of time. It's the intersection with the planet that makes it not an orbit. Anyway, I'm just gonna keep this here. You can see that the periapse position is actually moving ahead of me here. So that's a uh, 19 kilometers. It's dropping down. So if I want to, if I want to minimize this, yeah, that's a, that's quite a a little more eccentric than I'd like. We're at 20 kilometers on one side and about uh, 40 on the other. So I'm, what I'm doing is I'm pointing the spacecraft upwards so that my vertical speed or my tendency to go downwards is being reduced. Uh, that'll hopefully keep me at my current altitude while reducing my apoapse. There, do that a little more. Uh, yeah, see, periapse is rising to so about 20 kilometers. And my apoapse is coming closer. I think I think we're getting pretty close here to a circular orbit. This is all about OCD getting this perfect. Okay, so that is that is us in orbit. We will have successfully completed one of these contracts. We will have a space station in orbit. And uh, yeah, now we can actually use it to land on the moon. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.